All right, welcome back to Module 6. Now we're going to talk about shareholder liability. Shareholder liability is the flip side of limited liability. We discussed earlier that one of the core, one of the five core principles of corporations is that shareholders have limited liability. They will never owe more than what they invested. The exception to that is shareholder liability, uh, which goes under the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. So what is piercing the corporate veil? Piercing the corporate veil is a limit on limited liability. Uh, and uh, it's the exception to when shareholders uh, are not liable for more than they've invested. In the case of piercing the corporate veil, shareholders can end up paying out of pocket for corporate wrongdoing or debts. So piercing the corporate veil uh, has some alternative doctrines. Uh, alternatives to piercing the corporate veil could be a fraudulent conveyance or an equitable subordination. Other courses do without material. We'll focus on piercing. So when does piercing happen? There are uh, several factors that uh, are seen in tandem with piercing. However, the cases on them are, are definitely uh, different, so we'll need to look at some, some cases to understand more than just the basic principles. Uh, so this is not a laundry list, and if you see these six things, it will guarantee piercing. If you don't see these six things, it doesn't say there won't be a piercing, but these are some guidelines that are helpful for understanding what you need to do to avoid veil piercing. Because clearly, anyone involved in a corporation wants to avoid veil piercing because the purpose of entering your corporation is to limit liability. Anything which limits limited liability uh, goes as antithetical, goes against the purpose of the corporation. So we're going to try as attorneys to avoid that bad outcome. And how do we do that? We do that by respecting uh, several corporate obligations. Okay, so what are they? Well, piercing happens generally when the corporation is closely held. Piercing very rarely uh, I don't know of any case where it happens when the corporation is broadly held. So like a public company, for example, and you look at Microsoft, Google, you might be a shareholder of, of that or, or have a, a mutual fund which has shares in that. Uh, the likelihood of you, as a shareholder of a public company like Microsoft, being liable for the debts of Microsoft is essentially zero. And that's because the other factors just don't add up. But uh, in general, it only really makes sense to bail peers when the corporation is closely held and that's more of an outcome of, of an application of the other factors, but uh, right at the outset we'll mention that really when we see piercing, it happens in the closely held corporation context. Uh, deceit. Any kind of deceit, uh, when the insiders deceive creditors or, or other parties, uh, that's a good reason for bail piercing. If the shareholders are using the corporation for bad purposes, uh, the courts are much more willing to disregard the corporate entity and its protections. Uh, another reason, which is a little bit maybe odd to some, is uh, if if the insiders fail to observe formalities, so if they don't have meetings, if they don't do things by board resolutions, if they don't have separate bank accounts, uh, these things in themselves don't seem to lead to a conclusion there should be liability. But what's uh, insightful about these kind of behaviors is they show when they're there, they tend to show that the shareholders are using the corporation for their own purposes, uh, for bad purposes, and not really using it for proper corporate purposes. So. We do see a failure to observe corporate formalities leading to veil piercing in some cases. A big no-no is commingling assets. So the corporation is a separate entity from the shareholders. When shareholders treat the corporation as themselves, where they freely take the corporate assets, the courts are much more willing to, uh, on their end, so if shareholders basically disregard the separateness of the corporation and use its bank account for their own, uh, courts are uh, much more willing to also disregard the separateness of the corporation and refuse to allow shareholders limited liability in those contexts. So <clears throat> commingling assets is a big reason for piercing. Uh, inadequate capitalization is another reason, and we're going to see a case about that and what constitutes adequate capitalization. Uh, but if corporations are created essentially to avoid liability and for nothing else, we don't want them to exist for that purpose. It doesn't fulfill the purpose corporations are designed for, uh, and so we're not going to respect them in that context. Courts don't respect them in that context. And when the defendants actively participate in the business, that also gives us much more reason to pierce. Uh, so again, going back to the original analogy, if you're a shareholder of Microsoft, you clearly don't participate probably at all in the business. At most, you might attend the annual meeting. Uh, and if you're simply attending the annual meeting, that's not, that doesn't rise to the level of giving you access to, to do bad things to the corporation, only approve a very limited number of actions. So actual participation in the ongoing business tends to be a big factor. Let's look at our first case, Walkowski versus Carlton. So here, a defendant owns several cab companies. Uh, and the cab companies had the minimum amount of insurance, $25,000. This is New York, and that's all they required. And by the way, as an anecdote, uh, this is a time before medallions. Medallions, which allow a cab driver to operate, uh, are very expensive, and they were considered judgment-proof. 
So the company only had $25,000 of insurance, which was a statutory required amount. The plaintiff got hurt and was injured for more than that amount, tried to recover, couldn't, there was a limited amount of insurance, and tried to go after the shareholder directly. Was the company undercapitalized? No, the company met its statutory requirements and corporate uh, form was respected. So here we see a case showing that the corporate form is generally respected. Let's look at another case, right, as Wiki versus Telecom Corp. A uh, similar case, the plaintiff got injured, here was a motorcycle accident. A uh, Telecom Corp owned two subsidiaries, one was an insurance company, one was a trucking company. The trucking company purchased insurance from the insurance company, and the insurance company went, uh, went belly up, went bankrupt, and was not able to make good on its policy. Policy was for 10 million, and there's 100 a million extra. The plaintiff was a motorcycle accident, apparently it was very badly harmed. The insurance uh, that was remaining wasn't sufficient to cover it since the $10 million policy was not available. Uh, <clears throat> was the company undercapitalized? No. Again, they had gone through the steps to have insurance, and the court, the court said, why would anyone buy insurance from a company they thought was going to go belly up? The dissent had a different opinion, thinking that maybe there was something uh, more foul at play here because of the fact that they were both subsidiaries of one parent and shouldn't the parent have known that the insurance company wasn't able to make good on its promise, but that was the dissent. The majority opinion was that they had insurance, they complied with their statutory minimums. Again, no veil piercing. Again, veil piercing is the saver. Let's see a case where veil piercing actually existed. So in Freeman versus Complex Computing Corp, or C3, uh, we have an individual who created a, a technology while at Columbia University, and Columbia University wouldn't license the patent to get back to him. So he had essentially created a shell corporation only to receive the patent, Instead of being owner of that corporation, he became a consultant. And he was a consultant really in name only because this particular consultant had the ability at any time, at his discretion, to purchase all the shares of the company for a nominal amount of money. So first off, the court determined he was a constructive owner, he was a constructive shareholder, at any time he could purchase the company's shares, and he controlled the company as if it were his own. The company uh, entered into a really favorable transaction where they essentially um, uh, and he took all the money from that transaction. He took all the money from that transaction, and as a result, uh, he was not able to pay some creditors. Some people came to collect, and he wasn't able to pay because he drained the bank account. So first, the court determined he was an equitable owner. Even though he wasn't technically an owner, he was able to drain the account. He had access to purchase the shares. He was really the person who ran the affairs and was in charge. And the utility agreement basically gave him broad ability to do anything a, a manager would do. Uh, so in that case, uh, it was remanded for individual liability because it was determined to be an equitable owner and bail piercing was possible. Uh, I'll also mention on this slide that bail piercing in part was possible because he, I mean, he trained the bank account, he controlled the corporation. You see how the elements are, are present here. Right, we have another court uh, uh, case here, Thebarge for Starbro. In Thebarge for Starbro, uh, the court has a quote here which uh, we should remember. Uh, we will disregard the legal entity of a corporation with caution and only when necessary in the interest of justice. Of course, in my class, we discuss these cases much more fully, but for the purpose of our review, let's just remember this quote here, the importance of respecting corporate liability and the rarity with which we see bail piercing. We only see bail piercing when it's in the interest necessary for the interest of justice. All right, how about for corporate groups? So we have a different uh, analysis a bit when we have corporate groups involved. So in the case of Garden Mall versus Western Hotel, uh, essentially, uh, Weston, Mexico is a subsidiary of Weston, a uh, uh, U.S. and Delaware company. And uh, Weston, Mexico had a concierge. The concierge suggested a person go snorkel on the beach, which actually was known for having extremely dangerous currents. And this person went snorkeling in these dangerous currents and died, and his fiance upset, sued. But she didn't sue Weston, Mexico. Not sure why. Maybe she thought she had a better chance of collecting against. U.S. company because of better laws, but it appears she was maybe forum shopping and tried to collect, a, or maybe that Weston uh, Co. had deeper pockets. In any event, she went after Weston Co., the parent, not the subsidiary, and tried to claim that she was able to pierce the veil between wholly owned subsidiary and parent on the theory that the corporate relationship would allow her to do that. Well, that's not possible here, and it's not possible when the relationship is typical. This was a very typical bank uh, uh, relationship where these companies had separate staff, separate bank accounts, separate insurance, and there's no, ident uh, no evidence that blending these identities, I mean, yes, the building had Weston on the side, but the fact that Weston had its name on the building did not seem to give rise, did not proximately cause the harm to uh, our, our swimmer. We came to a different result with OTR Associates versus IBC Services. OTR Associates, a leasing company, leasing space in the mall, uh, IBC Services, 
IBC standing for International Blimpy Corporation. Um, Blimpy Corporation sells sub sandwiches. Uh, they um, don't operate the sub shops to franchise, so they franchise out the ability to operate these shops, and they do it through uh, through this IBC subsidiary, IBC Services. So IBC Services is a wholly owned subsidiary, and it, not only a wholly owned subsidiary, but uh, unlike in Weston, here the IBC had no asset of its own, no staff of its own, no income of its own, no premises, it shared an office, and people representing IBC services would wear Blimpy shirts. And so what happened here, the, basically Blimpy kept the company completely capitalized at nothing, it had no assets uh, except for its leases, which are really a liability in the income stream for the, um, uh, for the franchisees to pay for its lease, and it really was using this form in order to avoid uh, Blimpy liability for failed leases. And so in this case, OTR Associates was able to pierce the corporate veil because here, uh, uh, despite being mechanically impeccable, the only purpose for this existing was to shield the parent from its own obligations. So what's the upshot? Uh, the upshot is that in corporate groups, uh, that veil piercing when you have a wholly owned subsidiary is not going to occur when you have a typical parent-subsidiary relationship. You're going to see veil piercing occur when the subsidiary is created basically only to shield the parent from its own obligations. And in the personal context, you're going to see it, and I'll return to that slide with our, our features here. In a, in a personal context, you're generally going to see veil piercing where the corporation is closely held, uh, where it's going to be uh, an issue of deceit uh, against creditors, when there's a failure to observe corporate formalities, when there's a commingling of assets, uh, when there's an inadequate capitalization, although maintaining a statutory minimum of insurance seems to be adequate capitalization based on our case law, uh, and when the defendants actively participate in the business. So those are just some points to keep in mind when you think about uh, how to structure a company to avoid veil piercing. Obviously avoiding veil piercing, a major uh, component of good corporate practice. So keep good books and records, keep separate bank accounts, don't commingle assets, and the corporation needs to be created for its own independent purpose and not just to avoid the liability uh, of the parent. If a company is created only to shield someone from liability, it's more likely to be disregarded. And that concludes Module 6.